Plutopia News Network's digital privacy special concludes with a question and answer session featuring Ars Technica Senior Business Editor Sarus Farivar, author of Habeas Data, Privacy versus the Rise of Surveillance Tech. Since I started writing about this over the last five or so years, when I first started writing about it, Oakland specifically had no policy. So at one point, I filed a records request and I asked for the whole darn database. And they gave me 4.6 million records of license plate reader scans, which you can go to the Oakland website now today and still download. So if you want to do some fancy data viz and magic uh, and alchemy, you can go do that. Um, the EFF in San Francisco did get that database and they made a cool heat map uh, so you can see what parts of town are scanned more than others. Um, uh, nowadays, with the six month retention, Conceivably, you could ask for, for, um, uh, for the last six months of, of license plate scans. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what the policy is. You know, I think they're, a lot of the, with the Privacy Commission and others, they're trying to figure out like, what, what the deal is. And different states are more or less permissive with records. I know Minnesota, for example, is more permissive generally. Um, so there was a reporter uh, just a few years ago in Minnesota who filed the license plate records for the mayor of Minneapolis and got you know, a couple years of the mayor's uh, scans. And then uh, they changed the law so that that would happen again. <laughs> but, um, but there was a guy in Seattle who, who like, had like a blanket request for all body cam videos for the Seattle Police Department. And the Seattle Police Department was like, this is ridiculous. We can't possibly fulfill it. And he was like, hey, the law is the law. You got to follow the law. And they ended up hiring the guy. <laughs> and so now the Seattle Police Department actually has a YouTube channel that you can go to and watch. Like, and you know, there's stuff that's blurred out, but you can kind of get a flavor of, the, of what the Seattle Police Department is dealing with on their YouTube channel, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah. It's my understanding that we all think that this information is being used and retained by the police department. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of my understanding that it is sold. Yeah, so there are private actors that um, are in this sphere, right? Um, so with license plate readers are, are a good example. Um, many law enforcement agencies, I assume here locally, regionally as well, uh, every law enforcement agency, Travis County Sheriff, Austin PD, uh, whatever your neighboring town is. I'm sure you guys who live here locally know this better than I do, but if, if this region is like where I live, uh, right, every jurisdiction has its own little thing, and maybe some agencies like Oakland will put them on top of the police cars. Other cities might put them above the street. They might mount them sneakily in like little you know, traffic cones or whatever. Um, might be on your bridges, toll roads, things like that. Um, uh, but there are also private companies that do this as well. Um, there's a large company about an hour's drive from where I live in Livermore, California, about an hour east of Oakland, um, that has a really fun, totally not scary name uh, called Vigilant Solutions. Um, Vigilant Solutions is a company, so I mentioned I got 4.6 million records from Oakland. Um, Vigilant Solutions claims to have 10 billion records, wow. privately, nationally, right? And because they're a private company, they don't have to give idiots like me the time of day, right? They're not accountable largely to the public. The only way that we get an insight into what they're doing is if you ask them and if they choose to answer, or if you file a record request and you say, hey, give me the data sharing arrangement or the contract that you have with X, Y, or Z police agency. Um, then, we, you know, with, eight, with organizations like EFF um, and others that try to agitate to, to shed some light as to what's going on. So there are companies out there uh, that are doing that, right? There are also companies that are, and so th when they share, so what, what, what Vigilant in particular is doing is they're contracting with um, tow truck companies and repossession companies. They sell LPR license plate reader kits that mount onto like a tow truck. So the tow truck's driving around doing its tow trucking um, and it's scanning 60 plates per second all over the place, and then they're creating Vigilant's database. Vigilant then turns around and sells access to their database to the Austin Police Department, to the New York Police Department, to all over uh, the place. And if you're a policeman in you know, Austin or, or wherever else, you can imagine how useful that might be, right? If you steal a car, you're gonna drive it to, I don't know, Chicago or New Orleans or wherever, right? You'd wanna know all the jurisdictions in between to be, be able to find that stolen car or whatever. And I guess just to piggyback on that, I can't speak necessarily of companies in the Austin area that for sure engage in that. I can tell you that, um, to sort of go off uh, Sarusa's point, there are, I believe, in the Tri-County area, there are 17 separate law enforcement agencies who coordinate with the local Tri-County Fusion Center, the Austin uh, 
Resource Intelligence Center, Eric. Yeah. We had their directors speak at our meetup a couple years ago. So you can uh, go to their website and talk to them if you want more info. And if anybody locally is engaged in that, I would suspect it's probably Stratford because they do global intelligence risk assessment. So okay. it probably looks into that. They also have an officer. Right. Yeah. yeah, so there are these regional intelligence centers. You guys have one here locally. In where I live, it's called the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, or NICRIC you're in the know. Um, uh, and, and yeah, th this is kind of the, the nexus of all of this data sharing between these different agencies. Um, and where I live, at least in the, in the Bay Area, lots of cities, Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, are starting to realize that that data can then be shared with, agency, with federal agencies that maybe they don't want it to be shared with, such as ICE, that are used for the purposes of deportation. So you have cities that, as of very recently, within the last six months, um, who are starting to realize, hey, you know, we're, we're cool with, you know, amber alerts and stolen cars, but maybe we're not cool with, like, it sharing it with ICE for the purposes of deportation. So cities, I think, are starting to come around uh, and to, to, to realize, you know, maybe we don't want the data that's used for one purpose to be used for, for a different purpose. Um, but there's lots of other companies. You mentioned Stratford and others. Sorry? We would hope. Yeah, yeah. We would hope. I, I'm starting to hear that it's uh, coming down the pipeline with family law getting that record, yeah. your insurance agencies getting in hold of that information, and... The privacy rabbit hole never ends. It never ends. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just one second. I think there's a question in the back. One second. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, can you talk about, like, I know Carpenter was this vertical cell site location. Yes. Can you talk about, like, real time, you think that that's an issue, and, like, I know that Securus got, uh, like, that Securus was doing real type. Yeah. Yeah, so you brought up Carpenter. So Carpenter uh, is a much more recent case, right? So the events of Carpenter happened in 2010, 2011. Uh, it was decided at the Supreme Court just this past term, early 2018. Um, and the, the facts of the story are basically, there's a whole episode of the podcast Planet Money. They did a great episode about Carpenter that I recommend that you listen to. Um, but basically, uh, uh, there, it was a, instead of a meth gang, it was a you know robbery gang. They were stealing cell phones. They were stealing iPhones, Android phones in Michigan and Ohio, 2010, 2011. They would literally walk into a, store, a radio shack with a laundry bag and a gun, and it was just a straight stick up, uh, threw them in the bag. Um, in this robbery gang, for some reason, they needed three different guys named Tim. There was Little Tim, Big Tim, and Tim Tim. Um, not making this up. So Tim Carpenter is little Tim, if you're keeping score at home. Um, so, um, so Tim Carpenter challenges, and the way they find out, uh, or the, one of the tools that the police use uh, for the investigation of little Tim Carpenter is uh, through uh, something called a D order, which is the federal uh, section of, of something called the Stored Communications Act, um, where uh, the government goes to a uh, cell phone company, in this case Metro PCS, and they say, hey, Metro PCS, you got to give us the, the records. We don't have to show probable cause. We don't need a warrant for this because our good friend, the third party doctrine, says we don't have to get one. So they come and they show that we have to show relevancy to an ongoing investigation, and Metro PCS, or whoever it is, has to turn over the data. So they did, fine. They give 127 days of little Tim Carpenter's records. So again, like with Jones, Jones was 28 days with a physical GPS. This is 127 days of just getting the data, no trespass. So, um, and so the Supreme Court, again, was, was asked to answer the question, does that violate the Constitution? Is that a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Is that okay? Do you need a warrant to get 127 days of data? And the Supreme Court said, yes, you do. Um, uh, that is too invasive. Uh, you, you definitely need to, to get a warrant. Um, so you mentioned, uh, so that was for historical data, right? Uh, for what happened previously. You were talking about- Yeah, I wonder, do you think that real time is a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Like, have they touched that? Yeah, so it's interesting because, so you were talking, you mentioned Securus, um, right? So this company that was allowing um, uh, companies to basically, so if, you, if you've ever, um, maybe because you all are privacy nerds, you've never actually done this, but like if you, you can like allow, right? If you turn on location services in your phone or your location, uh, you can basically receive um, you know, location data. You can expose your location data for the purposes of advertising or whatever. You want to discount at some burger joint or whatever. Uh, you can opt into that. Um, there are also tools where, uh, and so what Securus was doing is it effectively was 
uh, an API call to allow your phone's location to be exposed, but it turned out that there were like three layers of companies that were, that were selling that or making that available. And so it turned out that it was very easy for like prison officials to abuse that, basically. <laughs> um, and so it was written about, I think it was in the New York Times uh, and others, uh, and I think that got shut down relatively quickly. Um, but is exposing data in real time a violation? I would say yes, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I think that, you know, if you're, I think you could argue that um, getting somebody's access to somebody's real time location data without a warrant, if you're the government, uh, is a violation, particularly under these newer cases like Carpenter, like Jones. There's another one that I didn't even get into called Riley versus California, which involves the searching of a, of a cell phone when you get arrested. Um, both Jones and Riley, the Supreme Court said 9-0. Unconstitutional, no way. Um, so the more recent cases, I think, would suggest um, with, and the most recent case, uh, Carpenter, uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority opinion there. Um, I think you're starting now to have justices um, and hopefully lower court justice, judges as well um, start to come around and start to think about these things in new ways. Um, a, a story, if you guys read Ars Technica lately, you may have known one of my favorite stories that I've written recently was a case involving uh, a group of guys running drugs from Canada to Los Angeles um, in a truckload of frozen cheese danishes bound for a Starbucks in La Puente, California. Um, and the police infiltrated this, this gang that had previously shipped nearly 200 kilos of cocaine in a particular truck. They knew the truck was gonna come through. Um, again, they'd infiltrated the communications, they had an informant. Um, so when the truck crossed the border at Port Huron, Michigan, um, that they thought was part of this drug trafficking uh, conspiracy, um, the, an agent from the FBI based in Los Angeles in uh, discussion with agents from Homeland Security Investigations in Michigan decided they were, that they were gonna put not one but two GPS trackers on the underside of this truck, uh, one under the cab and one under the trailer, under, and I mentioned earlier, there are these except, some exceptions to the Fourth Amendment, like exigent circumstances. One of them uh, is this border doctrine idea, right? That, the, that a, a normal search that does require a warrant does not apply when you're at the border. And the border, as you may know, doesn't, isn't exactly where you think it is. It's a hundred, the government claims that it exists 100 miles inland, uh, which covers quite a lot of us. Um, Two thirds of us actually. And, and so in this case, that, and this case that I just wrote about um, uh, very recently, that, and the events of it happened just a couple of months ago in Southern California, the government lawyers claimed that the border doctrine allowed them to install this GPS tracker at the border. They basically said the border doctrine trumps the Jones decision that I was just reading you from a moment ago. They said, it's no problem, it's the border. Not a big deal if they're driving from Michigan to Los Angeles, they're traveling basically across the entire country, uh, it's fine. So long as it's under 48 hours, why 48 hours? That's a magic number they seem to have made up. Um, but the government claims that it has this authority. And just recently, even though when a federal judge in Riverside, California, very recently, uh, said, no, no, -uh, you can't do that. That's against the Constitution. The government then came back. They dropped the charges against these guys. Uh, for drug trafficking conspiracy. But then they said, this is our policy. This is what we believe. So HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, literally today, not literally today, but like as we speak, right, has said to a federal court, our policy is we think that it's okay for us to put GPS trackers at the border uh, to track them in real time, to track their location uh, for under 48 hours for regular cars and more than 48 hours if it's a commercial vehicle. Why? Just cause. Um, and they're gonna have a court hearing about this in Riverside in November. So if you find yourself in Riverside, California on November 15th in the afternoon, uh, you can go to Judge Bernal's court and, and, and see what that's all about. Is HSI justifying this under Chevron deference that basically because there's no law explicitly saying how they must do this, they can interpret it how they want? I didn't see Chevron deference coming up in that. Uh, and, and as I understand it, that basically says that, yeah, that executive agencies can sort of have, have can, you know. It came up in the, it was most, it most came up in the uh, brand X case right. around net neutrality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they didn't raise that issue. That may be ultimately what they claim. Um, their, their argument was outlined in a 
pretty short, like two page brief that some assistant director of, of HSI submitted to the court recently. And if you go look on Ars Technica, you can see I wrote a couple of stories about this. Um, but every lawyer, every Fourth Amendment scholar that I've spoken to is like, well, hang on a second. Jones tells us that that shouldn't be right, um, that you shouldn't be able to track uh, without a warrant, you shouldn't be able to track somebody's movements for that, you know, for 33 hours is the distance from Port Huron to LA. Um, so, so yeah, uh, it's hard. And this is all kind of evolving. And this all, uh, you know, this, this genealogical tree continues and this rabbit hole never ends. And there are probably other metaphors I could come up with. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, and Gentleman in the Blue. Yeah. Um so uh, I'm just kind of going with uh, off of uh, the example of um, uh, what was that? What was that company in, in Vigilant Solutions? Vigilant Solutions. Yeah. yeah. So you know, here's a, uh, a a company that has this sort of monopoly on this kind of data, or mm -hmm. say that they're or, you know they're dominant. To try out. They're pretty sure. dominant in it, right? Um, we are now entering an age where. Um, uh, Foreign powers, which have far less uh, of, a, of a foundation in in, uh, in liberality, um, making you know spying on us basically, right? Mm -hmm. Like targeting um, targeting not, not just government uh, agencies, but providers of essential services, right? So. It's not just that you know a company is just a private company. They happen to be like one of maybe like three or four companies that have the capacity mm -hmm. to do a certain thing. So mm -hmm. therefore, they are a target, mm -hmm. and they therefore they are part of a national security threat, arguably. Mm -hmm. um, so has this come into play? I don't know if you've studied this. I know we're talking about like um, we're we're talking about. Uh, uh, you know, border security and, and terrorism security, but we're getting to an era where the threats uh, are not just from terrorist organizations, but nation states sure. um, that could be uh, uh, getting this information and perhaps, say in the case of Russia, who would probably wouldn't mind taking some of this data to find something to blackmail someone with, yeah. right? And use that as a, as a like to weaponize it, basically. Yeah. Has anyone been talking about that in the courts? Has that? Yeah, I, um, I mean, it's hard because um, it's very hard, if not impossible, for American courts to regulate the activity of foreign actors, whether they're governments or companies. What's that? An attribution is next to impossible. Right, and attribution also for digital attacks is, yeah. is next to impossible, as, as, as you said a moment ago. Because forensic signatures can be faked and spoofed. Yeah. Just because, you know, it's yeah, like this. Hitting, hitting the evidence rules. Right. Right. In, yeah. a, in a court, it's hard. In a court, it's really hard to Well, right. You know, reasonable doubt. Just because this looks like a Russian or North Korean right. signature, well, that's public knowledge, and I can fake this. But I think that you raise a point, which is, which is a good one, which is that as we start to accumulate, um, whether it's uh, things like license plate scans or you know facial recognition scans or even something as not relatively non-technical like you guys may remember the OPM hack right the office of personal management that China was believed to have perpetrated a couple years ago right where the Chinese government is believed to have stolen I think it's literally millions of government employee 50 million uh, government employee files of I think it's the SF86 form the clearance form that you know if you work at numerous government agencies you have to fill out that has all kinds of background information, all kinds of materials about you. Uh, and if, and it, right, <laughs> you're obviously much more well-versed than, than I am. Um, you could imagine what a treasure trove that would be for somebody like China, like Russia, like anybody else to have. Um, so, um, but that's, I think that that's a different kind of threat that, that we also, I think, should be worried about. Um, that's not something that I deal with as much in, in my book. My book is primarily focused on sort of domestic law enforcement and, and American law. But, but you're right to raise it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a solid point. Um, it's just the idea that, that you know, a lot, of, a, lot of these, a lot of these rules are being, at least a lot of these principles of privacy are being breached on the, on, with the argument being national security, national security. Sure. 
and now I think that there's, it's interesting that there's, there's, there's a growing argument for exactly the opposite using the same reason, yep. right? Like more privacy in the interest of national security yep. because of the, the threat, the, the change, the, the shift in the threat yep. and, and, the, and the change, the, uh, the threat, the, the, the increase in the level of threat that. Well, it's the same argument as why you can't have encryption backdoors because it's actually a security risk mm -hmm. right. from foreign actors. But it was it had been argued for so long the other. Yeah. It's well, like oh no, you can't have clear. privacy. That was because of security. It's Kalia. Yeah. Kalia. Kalia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Communications access law enforcement. Authority. The last one? I think it's authority. Is it authority? Something, yes. Authorization? I don't know. We can so, anyways, all right. Just going back to, I guess, domestic a little bit. Yeah. And um, talking more about Riley. Yeah. Where essentially it seems to me that the issue, right, was not the, the data itself, and we touched on this a little bit, but like the archive of it, right? Where it doesn't show you yeah. what you want to know, it shows you so many more insights mm -hmm. just because of how much data is out there. Mm -hmm. And thinking about, um, how much data is collected now in the Internet of Things, where everything collects everything? You know, um, it it seems like there's this real tension between um, stuff that sounds pretty reasonable from law enforcement requests and just the amount of data that they're allowed to be able to get from sources, but also like, you know, not only that that your wireless water cooler. You know they can get that data, but that the water cooler data also you know gets your blood pressure or whatever. Like what kind of water cooler do you have, man? <laughs> yeah. But you're right. You're you're right. How do we better um, understand that tension and and get it reflected fairly, where it's like. Is the answer just we don't allow anything to be collected, or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it depends on. It's hard, right? You could take the the. I don't know if you guys watch Battlestar Galactica, right? You could take the Adama rule yeah. and just not have anything be connected to anything, oh, right? Yeah, I always tell people it's very easy to to be totally private and have nobody spy on you. Uh, just throw all your devices into the nearest body of water, move to the mountains, and don't talk to anybody ever again, and then you're good. Um, <laughs> but. Right. The problem with that is we all like cat videos too much. Like, <laughs> like that's the problem. We like fun things that make us laugh on the internet. We like human contact, um, uh, as is evidenced here. <laughs> right. Um, so it's hard, and and companies are hopefully as we have more and more you know data breaches, and you have instances where right. So a lot of people have Alexas and these kind of smart speaker type of devices. You have instances where police are like, hey, this thing collects data, this thing records sound. I want to get at that. There was a murder case you guys may have heard about in Arkansas where uh, the police wanted to um, uh, get the Alexa data that was present at the scene of a murder. That was like. That's now. That's the technology that we live with now. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say one thing, which is I, I, I litigate constitutional criminal procedures. Oh, so there you go. On behalf of you the government and state court. And I can tell you that there is an insidious there's a problem. And, and it's not that people are evil or bad, but there's an assumption that as long as the courts suppress the fruit of the search, that that somehow protects us from that's the remedy. That the, 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 they look at the remedial aspect of this and they decide that the risk is less because you can't use it right. in a way. And, and there is something dark about that. Yeah. Right? And it is, it's dangerous. Um, it, it, I, that, that's important that that's a remedy. And the sure. courts, I think, jealously guard that remedy, and, and that's good. And, and the, the federal judges, I mean, would tend to be. They're they're like Roberts in this opinion. They're kind of getting it. Yeah. But but that doesn't answer the question because yeah. there's so much more data that uh, that I can access um, if I'm the government that I never intend to utilize in a corporate and yeah. for which that remedy is not sure. really valid. And, and I'm still waiting for dark web data to show up in a court case. Yeah, well, I know that's a, that's the thing is that there are, it's hard to bring this stuff couple, in. Uh, courts will exclude it if, if there's any sense that there's cheating, uh, right. especially after Carpenter. Carpenter has this 
this brilliant sort of view of the sheer absolute you know, control of my position. Right. We collect all of that, that's not appropriate, but um, but you can still do that. Well, it's funny, so. Right, well, and just, to, I'll get to the other question in a second. You, as you're describing this, to me that makes me think of, so in the wake of CATS, you guys probably well know, that's where we get the federal wiretap law, is in the wake of the CATS case, right? It's and very so, hard to get a wiretap, you're correct. It's hard to get a wiretap, and, and so we get this federal wiretap law. Prior to that, they wiretapped all day long, and they didn't admit it in court. There were no rules. I, don't, I think they just, the, the DOJ had like a standing rule. I don't know if it was a statute. No wiretap all day long. They only get a wiretap <laughs> rule if they want to use it. It's hard, but right. yes, yes. yes. there. Not being facetious, but they, it's more I got you. I got you. I mean, one could argue that your ISP is a 24-7 wiretap, yeah, actually. Even if you assume good faith on the part of the government. Sure. And, and you know, without it, it's fine. It's just uh, the process is often thought of in terms of constitutional procedure, which is what courts do, and totally. not in terms of the totally. capacity to have yeah. research. This gentleman over here. Yeah, so I'd say societally, we've, uh, our expectations, of, well, reasonable expectations of privacy are down. Mm -hmm. Does that have the same sort of effect legally, or is that not reflected? Well, so you touch on a good question. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, you know, so if you really dig into the like legal journals and you read like what the lawyers are talking about, what the law professors are talking about, what the judges are talking about, there's a question now, there's kind of an open question now as to like, what does reasonable mean, right? Is it, is there like an objective, like pure, like anybody can figure out what that means or does that change over time? Is it subjective? Is it malleable depending on the technology and the place and the context? Um, right, or your age, or, right? And, and so it's kind of an open question. And like if you, you know, if we put up a, a sign, uh, you know, that like every, or, or there was just like a rule, like, you know, everybody's house was gonna be videotaped and you expected that your house was gonna be recorded by the police, and you expect it, then, you know, like, what does that mean? Like, so, um, but I think a lot of us would be really uncomfortable with that. Well, it just sounds exactly like 1984, no hyperbole. Sure, sure. And, and it's interesting because, you know, I, so I lived for a couple of years in Germany um, from 10, 2010 to 2012. And one of the things I took away from that experience was, which sent me down this never ending privacy rabbit hole, um, was that in America, I think the default majority position is we're skeptical of government power and we're more accepting generally of private power. We accept Google Street View that a private company can drive down every, literally every street in America and take pictures of everybody's home and nobody largely bats an eye, but when the NSA does stuff, when your county sheriff is flying drones, people flip out, right? And in Germany and in Europe, it's kind of the opposite, right? People they are pretty accepting of government power and less accepting, generally speaking, of private companies. And I know this because when I arrived in Germany in 2010, in the spring of 2010, Google Street View was very new. And a lot of German politicians flipped out when, when a weird foreign company was driving weird cars with funny cameras on the top, taking pictures of everybody's homes. And they made a big stink about it, and Google ultimately decided that they didn't want to deal with the German privacy uh, community and stopped updating Google Street View uh, uh, data. In America, I think it's updated in most places once or twice a year. I think um, they still have a problem with Huawei deciding to release the same picture. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Maybe it's because it's a domestic company, we trust Google more than we trust Huawei, I don't know. But, but, um, but so yeah, I think that we have this kind of skepticism um, uh, and some of us maybe are more skeptical or less um, that is sort of built into our, into our culture, right? I mean, the whole, like, the Bill of Rights, I would argue, can be read uh, as, you know, a restraint on the government's power, what the government, because we're, we're afraid of the government being too powerful. Yeah, right? Whoa. And I think, you know, another, I think you point out very well the difference in European approach because when you look at, like, Europe proposing things like link taxes and copyright filters, once again, you'll know it's basically saying companies can't do these things, right. you know, but those restrictions would never be proposed right. in America. And boy, the GDPR problems are annoying. <laughs> Every website talks about this. There was a question by the gentleman over here. So, you explained that the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Can you 
specify what it's meant by effects? Effects, and our lawyer friends can help us out here, but effects, I take that to mean as um, the, the, the things that you carry, right? Objects that are on your person. Um, so in my case, this would be my wallet, the cards in my wallet, uh, things like that. Wouldn't it be your car as well? Your boat? Jesse? Yeah. So it's physical things. It's physical things, but, but then when we start talking about digital things, you know, if you're, if you're carrying a USB stick that's encrypted and it has your deep, darkest secrets on it, those are your effects. And then now we get into like, and this area of the law is evolving as we speak uh, as to like whether or not, and then you add the border into that mix, then you get into a whole another weird situation. Can you be forced to unlock your phone when you're at the border? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, and so there are these kind of weird situations where um, the modern equivalent of these 18th century words takes on different meaning. And depending on in what situation you're exploring that, uh, the outcome might be a little bit different. I, would, I thought it meant like actions. I don't think it means actions. I think it generally means physical, like it traditionally means tangible objects. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know better, yeah. but that's yeah. what it seemed like. And, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think I think actually cars provide a good way of looking at how often these concepts evolve because you know a car may not necessarily seem like an effect, but you know literally there's been psychological research done showing that people almost in when they drive in a car they almost embody it, where like they actually psychologically view the car as an extension of their body, and so that's sort of where the effects. In the car, it comes no. back from Hegel and Kant, right. and the original philosophers that define you know, the nature of man and what is a personal view is and that's actually the foundation of our intellectual property law as well. It's personal to you, personal to you is your impact and impact upon the world, and that's why they just work that. The categorical here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so basically, digital things that have that the human brain has incorporated into its sense of self become effects in other words. There's a gentleman in the back. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about personal right privacy and third party doctrine. Mm -hmm. How how does that intersect with me taking proactive, for lack of a better word, measures to secure my privacy mm -hmm. like encryption, mm -hmm. like using like, you know, say Swiss based cloud services, mm -hmm. <laughs> using open DNS to encrypt my DNS requests, mm -hmm. VPNs, does that, how, do, how does my desire to take actual proactive conscious steps to protect that? Mm -hmm. and am, I, awesome. am I at all mitigating this idea that I have no right to privacy? When, the, when, when this information is in third party hand, if I'm actually trying to take actions to yeah. secure that? Uh, I mean, our lawyer friends may be better situated to answer that, but I would say, uh, and you can, uh, is that there have been cases, I do know of cases, for example, that where courts have found that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your IP address. It's a thing that you need to connect to your ISP, just like you need a phone company to talk to someone on the phone. So even if you're using Tor, even if you're using a VPN, even if you're, right, even if you're taking every single conceivably human possible step, you're encrypting everything, you're using OpenDNS, you're doing all those things, even still, you're communicating something to the internet, right? You're communicating an IP address at a minimum, um, not to mention other kinds of things. Um, so uh, um, I know this often has, co or this has come up in, um, there have been cases that I've written about for ours uh, that sadly involve child pornography, right? And people who are using uh, Tor hidden websites to access child pornography, um, and the government has used um, what is often described as malware. Uh, if you want to translate that into government speak, they refer to them as NITS, Network Investigative Techniques, um, to trick people's Tor browser into giving up their IP address on the theory that your IP address is not private. And therefore, if we know your IP address, then we could just serve a nice little subpoena to your local ISP. And the ISP is like, oh yeah, here you go. Here's this person's billing information. And then a couple you know, days later, your door gets kicked in uh, and you get guns drawn at you. Uh, I assume that's how it works. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I mean, I think that, that you might say, I mean, I think that, that 
you're certainly allowed to use all of those tools that you mentioned. You're certainly allowed to encrypt your data. You're certainly allowed to use um, Signal and VPNs and whatever else you want to use, um, but it's not bulletproof. It's not, um, even if you're using a Swiss-based cloud storage or whatever. I guess my question is yeah. not, how does, is there any sense that trying to take, trying to be proactive mm -hmm. Changes what a reasonable expectation Changes what a reasonable expectation <laughs> well, this, 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 I agree. I feel that I, I, you know, like, like all these things, I, I use all these privacy things. Does that put me in the crosshairs of being a suspicious person now? Yeah. Just for having all these things, just for using a VPN. No, because all the, the law enforcement was too busy. <laughs> Well, I think, I, think okay. maybe, I think maybe a decade ago the answer might have been yes, but encryption has become very ubiquitous now, so you don't stick out very as much. Stick out. I wouldn't even show up on a Palantir anomaly detection. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm, I mean, and yeah, I, I think, well, one thing that I think both of you... But that is an interesting question, but right. that's back to the point is, is reasonable expectation subjective or objective, right? right? Well, well, right, and I agree with the government's response to that, and I, I, that I agree with it, which is, if that's the case, then I can lower the expectation by appealing to people that are dumb with their yeah. information. And so the, the, that's how you might counter it. And so it's ultimately a legal question. I think it does, it should uh, raise the expectation, but that argument can be used. Well, know, right, I, I think the so idea is like, does it somehow subvert third party doctrine of, oh, I actually did have a reasonable expectation yeah. of privacy because I encrypted all of it, even though I gave it to a third party. Right. So that's a great question. I, we may head that way now. I don't think it does much. The yeah. reasonable is, is, is uh, rejected. And you know, I, I guess should. <laughs> one one thing I kind of want to springboard off of is like, you know, you you mentioned the example of you know like um, trying to get from four the IP addresses for like child pornography cases. And I also think, you know, when you talk about sort of the, the Baltimore case with that really reprehensible dude terrifying oh. that one with the calls, I almost uh -huh. wonder, you know, a lot of these decisions the Supreme Court comes to often almost feel very arbitrary, like they come up with a new thing that they just come up with that case. Sometimes even it seems in blatant contradiction of their opinions in a prior case. And I almost wonder, have you, in studying this, noticed, is there a trend to they decide the law means what it needs to mean so that somebody we all hate, like that creep in Baltimore or child <laughs> pornographers, we can prosecute them and we didn't write the law to violate their privacy? I mean, there's kind of an old joke, you know, that you know the, the law is whatever five people on the Supreme Court says that it is, <laughs> which isn't really a joke because it's true, <laughs> or maybe it's funny because it's true. I don't know, but um, but yeah, but uh, uh, so you know, the Supreme Court in Carpenter, right? The Supreme Court had the option of overturning the third party doctrine. They did not. If you actually read the decision, they specifically saying we're not overturning the third party doctrine. Uh, you're stuck with it. <laughs> um, yeah. Location data, yeah, basically. Um, and so, uh, right, and the, 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 the thing that certainly Justice Roberts and the majority uh, in, who joined said that cell phones are different and cell phone location data is different. Um, and that, that, you know, with Jones and Riley, that your phone contains so much. Uh, in the Riley case, right, so this case involved, and I also read about Riley in the book, that case involved a guy in San Diego who was a suspected gang member who gets arrested and the police search him, they search his effects, they pull out his phone, uh, and they, take him, they end up taking him down to the station and they search through it. They didn't have a warrant to do that. The law didn't require them to have a warrant at the time. Um, and when the case reached the Supreme Court, the government basically said, hey, searching your phone, this was like a flip phone. It didn't even, forget encryption and all like fancy stuff, right? This is like a, 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 a like, you know, flip phone. This is like an early, early, early smartphone. I think it was like a Samsung, it wasn't even Android. It was like this like proto, like long forgotten OS. Um, and actually fun fact, the, uh, I think it was a Samsung MPH 300 or something like that, anyway. The lawyer who rep the, the Stanford law professor, um, uh, Jeff Fisher, who, who uh, represented uh, Riley at the Supreme Court, keeps that phone in his office in Stanford Law School. I've seen it. Um, not the, like, the actual one, but the same model. So you can you know, play with it if you go visit him. But, but the government said that searching your phone, and so in that case, they were searching his, his photos and his videos and stuff. And they said searching his phone is just like searching your wallet, searching your pockets, right? It's no different like when you get a pat down by the police. And um, Chief Justice Roberts, in this great line, in that opinion, in the Riley opinion, said, 
basically to make that comparison is like saying that a ride on horseback is like a flight to the moon, right? Like they both get you from place to place, but they're obviously totally, totally different is the point. Uh, and saying you government, your theory about this is wrong. Uh, so sorry. <laughs> um, anyway. We are almost out of time, so I'm going to say maybe one more question so we give anybody who wants to buy a book time to do it, anybody who right right has a signature time to do it. Yeah, uh, this is just more general question about your reporting and, yeah, and whatnot. Have you ever, have you ever um, been, have, have any law enforcement agencies or any third party ever tried to like intimidate you out of reporting? To intimidate me? No. Yeah, out of reporting something? Uh, that hasn't been my experience. Um, I, so I've been, you know, so this book came out in May and I've been lucky enough to get to speak to groups like you, to law schools, to various places. Um, not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, I was at the University of Kentucky uh, in, in Lexington, just outside Louisville. Um, and I was there with a friend of mine who had also written a book, also about law enforcement, not about like privacy, it was about like a marijuana bus in Kentucky from the 80s. Um, and while I was talking to somebody after, a guy came up to my friend Jim and said, uh, hey, are you, are you Jim Higdon? Uh, and he's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I really liked your book. His book's called The Cornbread Mafia. You should read it. It's about a marijuana bust. Um, um, and he's like, oh, I liked your book. And he's like, oh, thanks. You know, he's like, uh, what do you do? And he said, I'm, I'm with the FBI Louisville. Uh, and my friend Jim told me this, like, as we were driving back later on. I didn't even know. I didn't, the guy didn't talk to me there. So apparently, there was an FBI Louisville agent at my talk at the University of Kentucky. Um, he didn't introduce himself. You know, I didn't, like, maybe he was recording me. I don't think so, but maybe, I, who knows, right? Again, not a search, not a fourth minute implication. Um, it was open to the public, like he, uh, uh, you know, so that's fine. If the FBI wants to come listen to my talks, that's cool. Um, they're open to the public. Um, so yeah, but I have not, I haven't been, as far as I know, like intimidated in any way. Um, um, I have interviewed law enforcement, um, federal and local um, law enforcement about these kinds of issues and, um, you know, because I, I, I genuinely want to hear what they have to say. And it's frustrating a lot of times as a journalist, and I think this is a common experience amongst other journalists too, is that often, not always, but often law enforcement it doesn't communicate very clearly with the public in my experience. A lot of times you ask for a question like, how many drones do you have? And they either won't answer or they'll say like, you know, they'll give you something that's kind of nonsensical and bland. Like they'll say, like, you know, we obey all the laws. And you're like, okay, but how many drones do you have? Like, <laughs> you know, like, and then you have to file a records request. And then you have to rope in your lawyer friends at EFF or wherever to like help you figure it out. What should be, in my view, a pretty basic question. Like, do you have a policy for this? Can we see it? Right? Like, um, this like border thing with, I'm mentioning the guys with the cheese danishes and the, and the border, uh, you know, drug trafficking thing. I, I currently have a, a, a a FOIA, a federal, what is it, Freedom of Information Act request with Homeland Security Investigations because I want to know, like, show me the legal memo that your smart lawyers at, the, at DOJ, at, at HSI have drafted because surely somebody has written one that says, here's why we think what we're doing is legal and okay. I want to see that memo. And they have written back and they're like, oh, well, it's law enforcement sensitive, so sorry, you got to file a FOIA. And I was like, okay. So I filed a FOIA, but that's going to take months, maybe years, and I may not even get anywhere. Um, so I haven't, I've never felt intimidation in terms of like a big scary dude that's like going to beat me up in a back alley, but I've been like bureaucratically intimidated, if that makes sense, <laughs> like um, because a lot of times it's been frustrating to get straight answers from, from these agencies. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, definitely, thank you. Can you give away any more from your book? You have uh, uh, some uh, advice. Advice from the book? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the thing that I always tell people is, uh, and you guys are you know, involved in some way with EFF Austin, um, I would say start Start at home. Find out what your local law enforcement agency has. If you don't know how many drones your police department has, file a records request. Ask EFF Austin to do it. Rope in the folks in San Francisco. Rope in ACLU Texas or whatever other privacy activist groups that you have here that I probably don't even know about. You know, hang out with your friendly lawyers in the back, right? Like, uh, we're all friends, we're all in this together, and we're all trying to figure this out. Um, and honestly, like, I would say that is an easy place to start. Um, is to just 
get the basics of what do you have? How does it work? How do you use it? What's your policies? Who are you buying stuff from? Can I see the contracts? Can I see the memos? Can I see the invoices? Can I, you know, all that stuff, right? And because the FOIA is notoriously long and inefficient and sometimes might take years to get a result, I don't know how your public records are in Texas, but you might have better luck. Like they might, in my experience, local agencies are often more responsive um, than federal agencies. So you might actually get results. They might come on a DVD and you have to like find your DVD player, but like you got something, right? You got like 500 pages on a PDF or something that they put on one DVD for some reason. Um, uh, that's been my experience. Um, and I would just say springboarding on that, you know, um, you know, EFF Austin, we are a volunteer community run organization. We do what the board and the people who follow us and come to our events want to do because, you know, nobody's getting paid. We're doing this because we think it's important. It's labor of love. So, you know, if finding out that records information on law enforcement, like how many drones they own, if that's like important to you, you can be the person to do it. Like we'll gladly publish and disseminate the findings of your research, but literally there's nothing stopping you from calling them up and doing that in, in our name. And we you don't have to be a journalist or a lawyer or any, have any superpowers to file records requests. Um, <laughs> and I bet you, and I would bet you also, there are friendly journalists. I have a colleague from Ars Technica who's hosting me tonight here in Austin. Um, there are lots of reporters that would want to hear if you have results of filing those records requests. That would want to, and EFF in San Francisco, I can tell you, is very successful at saying, we filed this records request, here's what we found out. And we're telling you reporters that are interested in this to share this with a wider audience. So I would bet you that there are lots of uh, you know, reporters, activists, lawyers that would want to know. Uh, about these things. And one of the nice things about EFF Austin is we know those people. So if you're like, I found this thing, but I don't know who to talk to, come to us. There you go. All right. Anyway, thank you for some, spending some time with me. Thank you to EFF Austin. Thank you, Scoop. Thank you to book people in the back. Books are for sale. I'm hanging out until they kick me out. Saru's Farivar's book, Habeas Data, is available online or at your local bookstore. You may follow Sarus at ArsTechnica.com. Special thanks to Kevin Welch and EFF Austin for hosting both privacy forums featured on our podcast. I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.